This is the Fifth Estate Winning Headlines, your media police post. In this segment, we summarize some of the headlines that you might have missed this morning. We also take a look at the political pieces that we call cartoons in this country. Today is the 9th of December 2020 and I am Miss Gay. I'm Tom. And I am JM. In case you missed the headlines this morning, here they are. In the Daily Nation, young doctor who gave us his life. In the Standard, Uhuru quiet on crisis as Ryla's views draw fire. And in the star, BBI, ODM pushes for fresh amendments. Yeah. Shall we begin with the Daily Nation? Yeah, the Daily Nation, young doctor who gave us his life. And it's a sad story of Dr. Stephen Mogusu, a 20-year-old uh, medic who died of COVID complications. Uh, first and foremost, we would like to send condolences to his family. Mm. It must be heart-wrenching mm. to lose such a young man. Mm. Um, yes, but this uh, death has sadly been politicized and we would not have known of this story if it was not for the tweet of William Ruto, <laughs> who yeah. tweeted uh, his death and uh, I just wondered why. And I wondered to myself, mm. uh, was he so sincere in sending condolences? And the reason I'm asking this is because of uh, the recent history, of, mm. of recent history. Mm. Look, I think that him and some of his allies have become ambulance chasers and they're using this as a way to curtail uh, progress, uh, this country's progress. But also, also, I would also want to say this. Mogusu was a doctor at a county hospital. The blame that national government is getting to this, I, th I think is unfair. And if at all William Ruto and co were so serious about this death, then why not uh, suggest structural adjustments to the health uh, uh, to, to the health industry in this country? Why not say let's let's move uh, health from devolved functions to the ministry's functions, mm. right? Mm. And I think uh, he should be offering uh, solutions to BBI. And you see, absolutely. And and and, and I would like us to watch the, the 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 next clips just to see how serious he was about this death. Juzi wa mesema kwamba kuna COVID nineteen. Na COVID-19 ilikuwa tu homa. So mimi naambia serikali, mimi naambia serikali ya Kenya kama wako na pesa ya kutosha ile ambayo wanataka kuharibu na mwarifu. And, and, <laughs> and you know, another thing is uh, BBI does talk about the formation of a health commission. Yes that is supposed to uh, deal with the welfare yes. of, uh, of doctors. Yes. And so these are, he should be making concrete proposals as opposed to telling us yes. that uh, we put uh, BBR on the back burner altogether. You see, JM, in the clip that we've just watched, mm. he, uh, his people, are, uh, his people on, on the record have said that Corona is kusha. You know, mm. and he's on record. He, you can see him in the video. He is laughing out there. <laughs> There's record of him going out to public rallies without a mask, mask. Yes. right? If mm. at all he was so serious about the infection uh, rate of this of, of of COVID in this country, he should yeah. be wearing a mask. But yes. but but but, but uh, talking about and politicizing a young man's death for his own selfish political reasons, uh -huh. I think it's unfair to this man's family. Yeah. Um, and and, and, and uh, I also think now, away from, uh, from William Ruto, maybe as well, uh, public Ministry of Health will probably need to communicate a little bit better uh, with mm. regard to, to, to this, because you cannot have doctors across the country. This is not to say that there, there are no challenges, but I think government is doing so much more that can be communicated out there yeah. to ease public depression on this matter. Yeah, absolutely. Now we've got a three-part criteria that we use to assess the headlines. Are they topical or speculative, repetitive or groundbreaking, finally thoughtful or just plain lazy? I think uh, this is a somewhat topical one, mm -hmm. uh, given what happened uh, recently. Yeah. But uh, I think it's, it's rather skewed um and also you quite know, sad yeah yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's a sad one i don't know yeah. uh do we put that in the parking bay or will you toss it parking bay parking yeah, bay yeah, yeah okay yeah let's move on very quickly to the standard um and in the standard they're telling us that odm leader raila odinga uh got some backlash last evening for calling out doctors over their plan to go on strike so he also issued a statement on this on this matter uh, and it turns out now that uh, doctors have called off their strike until December 21st uh, to allow for dialogue. And Raila was just calling upon 
uh, the oath, it was reminding them of the oath that they had taken yeah. uh, regarding, uh, uh, you know, being there for patients mm. uh, when they're sick. Uh, Ms. K, you, you, you had something to say on, on this one, <laughs> on the dilemma I think the doctors face regarding their oath and... I think there are two bearers of responsibility here. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the bearers of responsibility, yes, is the government. Mm -hmm. The government does have a responsibility to provide um, equipment to any of its workers as they go out in the field to work. Yeah. And one of the equipments here is a PPE. Mm -hmm. But the other bearer of responsibility, I think, is the Kenya Medical Association. Yeah. And before I go to the Kenya Medical Association, I just want to say that there's a bigger question here about ethics and pandemics and the duty to treat. Yeah, absolutely. The question about whether nurses, physicians, and other healthcare workers should be should have the duty to care for patients mm. when doing so exposes them to personal risk and their own families mm. to risk is a question that can never end. It has. It is a question that we keep coming back to. We went to it during HIV, and we're here again during yeah. Corona, and we'll yeah. go to it again when we yeah. have another disease that yeah. is threatening. Yeah. But I do have this to say: mm. even as the government does its part, and I feel like this report has been skewed, and you don't yeah. know what the government is doing. Mm. I think that the Kenya Medical Association also should do its part. Mm. You want to protest? There are better ways to do it. Mm. Create guidelines that give you how, how how do you proceed in a in an environment of COVID? Yeah. When is it that you can? How how can do you place the limits on the personal sacrifices that the doctors have to make? Mm. And the bearer of that responsibility is the Kenya Medical Association. Yeah. Put out those guidelines, let the people know that this is how far the doctors can come and no further. Yes. And we won't question it. Mm. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Well, uh, what do we think of that headline? Uh, no, I don't uh, like it. <laughs> uh, uh, you see, you see uh, JM, yes, it is true, the president is quite on the crisis, uh -huh. but there's an entire ministry that can be able to do this. Yes. Um, and and that's, why, that's why we said it probably could be our communication issue. It is not to say that the Ministry of Health is not doing anything. Mm. And by the way... As well as the Council of Governors. Yeah. They and, should and, also and, and also the, the Council of Governors. The Health by Committee. The way, be, yeah. Because health is a devolved function. Absolutely. Uh, but it is not to say that government is not doing anything about this crisis. And by the way, we would be in a much worse situation if the Ministry of Health guidelines were not being followed. Yeah. So it, it, it's not the fault of the Ministry of Health as such, but... Okay. Yeah, now, are we are we keeping or tossing? I think we toss, toss it. We we'll toss it. Yeah. All right. And in the star, what do we have? BBI ODM push for fresh amendments. Mm. So the paper intimates that a legal opinion exclusively obtained by the star states that the Raila team is in fact admitting that it is aggrieved by some of the changes made to the bill <laughs> really? on the day of the signature launch. Mm. They say that prior to the launch of the signature campaign, the bill was printed in the morning. And in view of the hurry to print the mm. bill for the launch, some matters which had been previously agreed upon by the parties were left out. And they say that one partner is particularly aggrieved by the last minute changes effected by the bill before publication mm. and they specify that during the launch Ryla passionately spoke about how BBI will cure electoral fraud by having a section of IEBC bosses nominated in political yeah. parties. Mm. It later emerged that that proposal had been expunged from the final bill dealing a blow to Ryla's long held reform agenda. Mm. It says that now this stalemate that is brewing in the insides that we do not see on the outside is a political hot potato only spoken of in hushed tones. Highly speculative. <laughs> Highly speculative. I mean, who? I mean, we, all, we all know who was the star. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not a... But, but Ryla had a bloody good point yeah. on, <laughs> on the uh, formation of the IABC yeah. and reconstitution of it. Yeah. It's, it was sad to see that provision go. He definitely convinced me. Yes. Now, um, between the Daily Nation and the star, do we feel like any of these are worth giving a, a winning headline? Yeah, I, I think, yeah. But uh, I think for, no. for, for sensitivity's sake, we yeah. park the Daily Nation because someone's lost his life. Absolutely. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, and so we do not have a winning headline today. Uh, but onto the political pieces that we call cartoons in this country. We've got a three-part criteria that we used to break them down. Yeah. Are they humorous or dry? Satirical or pessimistic? Ineffective or just plain lazy? Let's begin with the Daily Nation. Daily Nation, you have, uh, oh my goodness, caricature of Uhuru Kenyatta. Uh, what is that? Is that, is that BBI? Yeah, BBI uh, signatures. Sig mm. BBI signatures. Next to him is caricature of William Ruto with a wheelbarrow. And uh, Blue one. next to them is, yes, Israel Odinga with a BBI report. And uh, passing right in front of them is a locust. And there's a man coughing. And the caption there is a second locust. Wave. <laughs> Wave. Wow. <laughs> 
I think uh, it's a busy cartoon. Really. Yeah, busy. It's, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's a that's actually the word. I think it's a rubbish cartoon. Busy. I think we just toss it. It's toss insinuating it. that right. all these guys are focusing on their own things and the big yeah. issues are just passing them by. Yeah. Now onto the standard. Mm. Uh, here we have a cartoon of three men traveling on camels that appear to be the three wise men mm. uh, from the Bible, and one man is giving the other uh, a sanitizer, uh, and they're telling each other to keep their masks. Mm-hmm. Uh, one is saying, "Gentlemen." Yeah, mask on, sanitizer ready, and social distance. Yeah. And they're practicing that. And then the uh, caption there says, rumor is the new kid will cure the damn virus. Mm. And this is probably in reference to the vaccine, is it? Or who's the new kid? Uh, it must it be could Jesus be Christ. Christ. <laughs> Oh, must be Jesus Christ. Okay, okay, it's yeah, Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> hallelujah. That's, All right. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I know he, he will. Quite, he will quite, cure this. Amen. Qu- quite cheeky of you. Yeah, very this, cheeky. Yeah, the star. A good one. The, can In the, do the star, star, we have a caricature of um, <laughs> COVID as the Grim Reaper. Yeah. And he's getting ready to eat. He's been served by his waiter, the government, wearing a red bow tie. Mm-hmm. And having opened up the cloche is... A health worker lying on the plate, passed oh. out, gone. It's really sad to look at in his scrubs and lab coat. And I think here it's in reference to our headline of the Daily Nation. Mm-hmm. Again, mm-hmm. I will say, surely, let's have limits to the personal sacrifices that can be made by doctors. Let us stay here and no further. Then we all agree and we're clear. Mm. I, I, I like that. But what does a loan? Well, what, are the, what does loan appetite have to do with a doctor's death? These are the fellows who are cre- creating oh, toxic bon pessimism. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Bon appetit and then it says loan appetite. Mm. Mm. Uh, yeah. Whom should we give the winning cartoon? I think the standard. <laughs> standard. Yeah, Gado. <laughs> standard gives us our winning cartoon. And now, on to our final thought. But before we get there, please don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And so what is our final thought? And now our final thought, it is inspired by a book entitled The Biafra Story, The Making of an African Legend by Mm -hmm. Frederick Forsyth. Frederick Forsyth (coughs) is a British-born journalist who, while working as an assistant diplomatic correspondent for BBC, covered the Biafran side of the Biafra-Nigeria War from July until September of 1967. Mm. He returned to Biafra in 1968 and continued to report on the war as a freelance and later for the Daily Express and Time magazine. The book cost Frederick Forsyth his job as a BBC correspondent and Mm. his career as a journalist. He wrote the Biafra story as an angry young man infused with a sense of mission. In fact, in the prologue of the book, he himself says that reading the book 30 years on, with a a marvelous (coughs) gift of 2020 hindsight, it Mm. is tempting to revise, re-edit, and modernize the script, to temper the polemic, and to mute the anger of the opinions. But he doesn't do so because, and again I quote, I was then a deeply angry young man with a cause. I had seen such misery, so much starvation, and death, so much cruelty inflicted on small children, yeah. and I knew that behind it all were vain and cynical men, not a few in high office in London, who had closed their eyes, their hearts, and their minds to the agony of these children, rather than admit that they might have made a mistake. Mm. For him, Biafra was a mistake, and it should need never have happened. Mm. In the book, Forsyth presents the Biafran case. Mm. He seeks to explain what Biafra is, why its people decided to separate themselves from Nigeria, how they reacted to what was inflicted on them, and it is the Biafra story, and it is told from a Biafran standpoint. Mm. As far as he was concerned, the disintegration of the Federation of Nigeria was not an accident of history, but an inevitable consequence of it. Mm. And he denounced Britain's support of the Northern government in place as a repudiation of the principles Britain was supposed to stand for. Mm. He began the journey to the war by tracing Nigeria's colonial history. He says that it is necessary to understand how Nigeria was formed by Britain out of, eco- reconcilable, out of irreconcilable people yeah. and how these people came to find that following British rule, the differences among them, far from shrinking, became accentuated and how the structure left behind by the British was finally unable to contain the explosive forces confined within it. Yeah. As Prof always says, we are an amalgamation, like a sack of potatoes. Yeah. Nigeria had never <clears throat> been more than an amalgam of people welded together in the interest 
and mm. for the benefit of a European power. Yeah. To the south were two peoples, the, the Yoruba of the western part of, Niger- of, of the south yeah. and the Igbos in the eastern part. Yes. In the north, occupying a large mass of Nigerian land and over 50% of the population were the Fulani. Yeah. The Igbo were predominantly Christian, egalitarian, were held, mm. were ruled by a king, yes. but they had a more democratic form, we could call it, of governance that yes. allowed for a senate that made decisions. Council yeah. of Elders, if you could call it. Yeah. The Fulani, on the other hand, were predominantly Muslim and yeah. were ruled by a religious elite. So following the laws and the rules of their elite was not just a political requirement, it was a religious one. In the middle were the Yoruba, who were a halfway point between the two. Not as egalitarian as the Igbo and mm-hmm. not as strict as the Fulani. It is said that the North people were obedient and undemanding, mm. therefore they were more amenable to British rule and they were amenable to foreigners. Mm. In fact, I watched a video in which one um, Fulani leader mm-hmm. said that they would continue to put in Fulani people in all prominent positions of power as mm. a perpetual policy of government. Yeah. <laughs> However, the Igbo people were a more, and as I think we know them, yeah. <laughs> outgoing <laughs> and more educated yeah, yeah. and continue to take on positions of power even though the majority of the Fulani would yeah. continue to take power through the elections. Yeah. I think that it is true to some extent they inherited a bad hand. Yeah. Yeah. So, Ms. K, would it be right to say that was uh, came from Mount Kenya? You can <laughs> imply. <laughs> I don't know what they'll say about that. <laughs> No, I, I loved uh, chapter three. The, uh, the, it was called The Man Called Ironside. And I, I actually want to rename it. So The Man Who Brought Coast to Nigeria. Mm. Now, Ironside, his name was actually Major General John Thomas Umanakawe Agui Ironsi, better known as Johnny Ironside. Yeah. He got his name when he was commander of the entire <coughs> UN peacekeeping force in the DRC at the rank of Major General. Wow. He was Africa's first officer to hold that command. Now, during operations in DRC, he was known for single-handedly engaging enraged mobs and persuading them to disband. Now, this and similar exploits land uh, and him the affectionate name of Johnny Ironside. Mm. Now, Ironside was the first military head of the state of Nigeria. Yeah. Now, in January 1966, this man does a coup on the first president of Nigeria, a man called Namdi Azikiwe. Yeah. But Namdi was just a ceremonial president. He did not control government. A man known as Abubakar Balewa did. Mm. He was prime minister. Mm. Ironside asked of all Balewa's cabinet to resign. Mm. Mm. Ironside takes power on 16th January 1966 and suspends the constitution. Mm. But he doesn't last long. On July 29th, 1966, Agui and Ironside spend the night at the government house in Ibadan as part of a nationwide tour. Mm-hmm. His host, Lieutenant Colonel Adekunle Fajui, military governor of Western Nigeria, whispers intel of a possible mutiny within the army. Mm. Agui and Ironside desperately tried, uh, tried to contact Ironside's deputy, hint, hint, army chief of staff, Yakubu Kowon. But he's unreachable. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, he's unreachable. He's a muteja. Yeah. In the early hours of the morning, the government house in Ibadan is surrounded by soldiers. Both are arrested and assassinated. Mm. It's a counter coup. Yakubu Guon takes over. Of course, he planned the coup on his boss. Mm. But that's not the story. Part of the coup plotters were the following Major Mutala Mohammed, <laughs> Captain Theophilus Danjuma, mm. <laughs> Lieutenant Muhammadu Buhari, Lieutenant Ibrahim Bambagida, mm-hmm. and Lieutenant Sani Abacha. Do these names ring a bell? Now, four out of the five men at one point were heads of state of Nigeria. One is now president of Nigeria. Mm-hmm. Welcome to mm-hmm. Africa. <laughs> yeah, this was a very interesting book. I don't think I had really understood uh, that the whole Nigerian history during that era before today uh, as I have understood it. Yeah. Um, and so let me just talk about the, the two uh, protagonists of the Biafran War. Yeah. Uh, and uh, there's Colonel Yakubu Gowon, whom you've mentioned uh, to him. Yeah. And there's also a man by the name Chuk Wemeka Odum 
Egwu Ojukwu, also known as Emeka, also known as Colonel uh, Ojukwu. Yes. You will uh, forgive me for not being able to pronounce these very clearly. It's all right. So let me give a story uh, this way. Post-independence Nigeria in the 1960s was, was defined by uh, corruption, by inter-ethnic tensions and civil war. Um, they didn't really have this sort of consociational democracy that we are saying we need to have in Kenya today. Yeah. And 1966 was a particularly terrible year for Nigeria, as you've mentioned, uh, 2M. Yeah. So after the January 66 coup, deterred that overthrew the government of Azikiwe yeah. and the then Prime Minister uh, Tafawa Balewa, mm, yes. uh, Ironzi becomes head of state. Yes. And uh, in July 1966, as you also mentioned, there was now a counter coup. Yes. Now, according to history, yeah. the original intention of Murtala Muhammad, yeah. who was actually the man really behind the coup, yeah. and his fellow coup plotters whom we've mentioned, yes. seems to have been to engineer the secession of the northern region altogether yeah. away from Nigeria as a whole. Okay. But they were subsequently dissuaded of those plans by certain people within their circle, also by the international community who had interests in Nigeria remaining uh, a, a unified state. Yes. And so the young officers chose Lieutenant Colonel Gowon yes. uh, to become head of state. Yeah. And he ruled the country from 1966 to 1975, about nine years. Yeah. And up until then, Gowon, we are told, had remained strictly a career uh, soldier with no involvement in politics. Yeah. And the reason the coup plotters from the north uh, chose him yeah. was because of his unusual background, mm -hmm. also as a northerner, yeah. who was neither of Hausa nor Fulani ancestry, yes. nor of the Islamic faith. Yes. Uh, and that made him a particularly safe pair of hands to lead a nation whose population at that time was seething with ethnic tension. Yeah. Um, so he was from the small tribe known as the Shosho. Yes. Um, now recall that the July coup of 1966 it didn't succeed in in its entirety. Yes. Much as they took out uh, Ironside, yes. um, the, the coup did not succeed in one particular area, yeah. and that's the southeastern part of Nigeria, yeah. where Lieutenant Colonel o Ojuku yes. was the military governor. Okay. You see, also, we should bear in mind that during that coup, Nandi yeah. Aziki were just evaded it by being on holiday. Yes, <laughs> yes. Ab absolutely. <laughs> he and, and the rumor there is that uh, these people from the south, yeah. um, and he was also one of the southerners, yeah. had been, he'd been uh, had, uh, given him a tip yes. to tell him we're going to do a coup, so you know, stay abroad for a few more days. Yes. <laughs> now, you see what happened, yeah. Ironside, when he came to power, because yeah. Nigeria at the time was pretty much split into four uh, regions, yeah. Uh, he appointed uh, regional uh, military governors. Yes. And so Ojuku was one of the military governors. Mm. Uh, he was born in 1933. Uh, he died just the other day in 2011. Yeah. Um, and um, he was a beneficiary of that January coup, as I'm saying. Yeah. And so he, uh, as the military governor for the uh, Biafran territory, yeah. uh, which he later uh, uh, called it, uh, refused to, you know, to 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 be part of um, uh, of 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 the, uh, the constellation of of the new constellation yeah. after the counter coup of sixty six. Yeah. And so um, once uh, Ironside was killed, we yes. are told that Ojuku insisted that the military hierarchy has to be preserved. Okay. And in that case, he mm. said the most senior army officer after Ironside yeah. was Brigadier. Baba Femi Ogundipe, hey. and and he insisted Baba Femi should be the one to take over leadership, not yes. Colonel Gawon, yes. uh, uh, with whom they were in the same uh, rank with. Yes, uh, but the leaders of the counter coup insisted yes. that Gawon be made the head of state, yeah. and so we are told that the falling out uh, from from that uh, issue is yes. what led to a standoff between Ojuku and Gawon, yes. uh, leading to the sequence of events that led to. Uh, the Nigerian Civil War. Yeah. Uh, on the 30th of May 1967, yeah. Ojuku declared Eastern Nigeria a sovereign state known mm -hmm. as uh, Biafra, Biafra after the peace accords uh, completely failed. Mm -hmm. And on the 6th of July uh, 1967, or, uh, just over a month later, Gowon declared war and attacked Biafra. Whoa. Eventually, Biafra ended up uh, uh, surrendering to Nigeria yeah. and the war was lost for Biafra. Yes. Uh, a very rich uh, history Straight. with very many personalities, coups and counter-coups and counter-coups. 
yep. uh, fascinating to read. Yes. On a day where we didn't have a winning headline, we had a winning cartoon from the standard. I will leave you with this quote from William Shakespeare talking about ambition. As he was valiant, I honor him. But as he was ambitious, I slew him. Slew here being I slew, took him out. <laughs> slew. Like what slay. these the slay, precisely. Yeah. Slay. Yeah. What these Nigerian uh you know generals were Did doing to each, to other. each other. Yes. Uh and you know, it's only the other day. I think that the Nigerians uh, uh, finally got a civilian president yes. once again, yeah. not too long ago. Yeah. Um, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're also on your TV screens. Find us on TV and Star Times.